Hi, everyone. Uh, appreciate you being here for the next half hour with me instead of getting an early start on the food truck lines. Um, let's just jump into it. I want to do a little housekeeping first. If you have some constructive comments you want to make, my Twitter handle is up here. It's on the bottom of every slide, the conference hashtag. I know that there is um, some confusion about which hashtag to use. That's the one the conference organizers say to use, so that's the one I suggest you use. Um, if you have non-constructive comments, you can keep them to yourself. Uh, nobody will be harder on me after this presentation than I will, so you really don't need to jump in. Now, when people give talks, they usually have some sort of disclaimers at the beginning, telling you all the things that you're not supposed to think. And I, I have that, too. Um, first of all, this is not my employer's opinions. Uh, I'll, full disclosure, I work for Red Hat. Nobody at Red Hat has seen this deck or has really talked to me about this very much at all. Um, I'm glad my management is not in the room because that makes me feel a little more uh, comfortable. This is not my project's opinion. So I'm the program manager for Fedora and for CentOS Stream. I'm involved in some other projects as well. Nobody in those projects believes these things I say. And you know what? I'm not even sure I believe the, some of the things I say in this talk. And so as you're going through here, you might you might be thinking to yourself, wow, this guy's an idiot. What is he talking about? This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. At some point later in the talk, I may argue against myself. So just hold on to the end. At the end, if you still think I'm an idiot, well, that's fair. And the biggest disclaimer is you'll notice the talk title had a question mark at the end. And I am really not here to give answers. I am here to ask questions. As I was rehearsing this, I did realize that Actually, I'm, I am giving something approaching like quasi answers uh, throughout, especially towards the end. But these are really more like sort of suggestions or just like idle thoughts I've had. They're not answers. I'm not here to say this is what we should do next. So what even are we talking about, right? So this was inspired by a conversation that I had with Delissa Alexander, who's Red Hat's executive vice president and chief people officer. Um, one of the projects that this talk does not represent the opinions of is opensource.com, where I've been a correspondent for several years. So every year we get together in Raleigh, North Carolina. We talk to a Red Hat executive, and they tell us how wonderful our writing is. And we generally all pat each other on the back. Uh, but a few weeks ago, the site celebrated its 10th anniversary. So that was a lot of the subject of the conversation back in October. And we were talking about, wow, look how different the site looks uh, compared to 10 years ago. Like, it looks like a real website now, and it's not this, you know, hacked together stuff. And look how much the community has changed. We have writers from inside Red Hat and outside Red Hat, and some of the writers have been hired by Red Hat, and some of the writers have left Red Hat. And, like, it's all over the community. It's all over the world. It's pretty great. But the thing that, that Delissa talked about maybe the most was, OK, but 10 years ago, we were trying to, like, we were, opensource.com was like fighting to show people that open source is okay. It's a thing you can use. It's like useful and it's good for you and it's good for the world and all of this. We had to like get people's mind share. And now, like 10 years on in, you know, 2019, now 2020, people mostly get that. Like, open is the default for a lot of things now. And so I asked her, I said, all right, well, that's great, we won. Now what do we do? What's the next 10 years? What are we trying to do now that we've convinced people that open source is an acceptable answer? And she gave me a really thoughtful response, and I was listening to her and not writing down any notes, and I couldn't tell you what it was now. Um, and I really regret that, because it was a really good answer. And it wasn't like a specific answer. It was just you know, sort of like, here's some general path we should go on. But by the same token, like, I started thinking about it from my own perspective. Like, what do I think about what the future should be? So like I said, we won, right? Like, everybody accepts open source. Now, I realize this is one of the parts where you might say, Ben's an idiot. What's he talking about? And so I'm going to give you just a brief uh, bit of evidence for the fact that we've won. So if you remember back in 2001, Steve Ballmer, when he wasn't jumping up and down yelling about developers, called Linux a cancer. 
Now, most people have a very negative opinion of cancer, for good reason. And for Steve Ballmer to equate Linux with cancer, like that's, that's a pretty strong sentiment, right? Like That's not good. So Steve's off owning a basketball team now. And in 2015, Microsoft loves Linux. Now, I know a lot of people actually do not trust Microsoft on this fact. Um, but I'll, I'll share with you that for prior to working at Red Hat, I worked at Microsoft for a while. And they really do believe this. Now, you can argue about whether it's like an actual deep philosophical understanding of how they are wrong and how Linux is actually great. Or you can say, well, crap, we're gonna, if we want to keep making money in the years to come, we need to get on board this Linux train. And I would say it doesn't matter which one is the, the case, because either way, they're still providing their support. So another example of winning is you may remember remember that Ubuntu had bug number one in their bug tracker. This is l legitimately a bug they had in their tracker. Microsoft has a majority market share. And at some point, Mark Shuttleworth announced that he was closing the bug. Now, you can argue about whether or not that's appropriate. Microsoft still has a pretty huge market share in desktop PCs. Um, but you know, for years, we've talked about the year of Linux on the desktop, and it's here. It's called Chrome OS. And again, you can say, well, you know, I don't like Google, and I don't like the way Google develops it. They're not really, like, they're technically open source, but they're not really embracing the community ethos. And that's valid, but it still checks all the boxes. So technically, we won on that front. And it's not just the software. It's you know, open standards, too. Jack Dorsey said, hey, I'm going to throw together a team and make uh, some decentralized standards for social media because you know email has a standard that's been around forever and email just works. You can email people across di different domains and it all just magically happens sometimes. Um, <laughs> now again, you can argue that Jack is kind of nuts and okay, well there's already been several attempts at this that Twitter has just bulldozed and you know Twitter had this itself in a way uh, back when they still let third-party developers actually use the API. And full disclosure, I'm a third-party Twitter client developer, and I hate them very much, and I wish I could escape that site. I just can't quit it. OK, so now what? We've won. We can't all retire to the beach, because if we could, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on the beach. I'd have a little bottle of whiskey and a stack of novels, and I'd just be sitting there all day under a really big umbrella because redheads burn quickly. But I, one of the things I started thinking about is, does our victory for, you know, let's assume it exists for a moment, does it explain some of the tumult we've seen in open source lately? Like, it seems like we were all getting along, and now we're not quite getting along as well as we used to. Like, we're writing new licenses to solve old problems. So, you know, for a long time there was these license wars where the copyleft left advocates were promoting you know, these strong licenses that protected user freedoms. And you have people advocating for permissive licenses that were really focused on pr protecting developer freedoms. And everybody kind of had the same idea of like, free software is good, open source is good, let's get it out there. But we had some philosophical disagreements. And that kind of reached a detente. Like we're not fighting each other over that as much. Like we're maybe still sniping on the sides. But much like the editor wars are just kind of a joke now more than an actual fight, licenses were kind of like that. But now we're seeing a bunch of new licenses crop up again. Bruce Perrins quit the open source initiative because he assumes that a license that he did not think was respecting freedom is going to be passed. And that, if you don't follow the OSI's license discuss mailing list, boy, the discussion of that license has been just incredible. Um, not always in the good sense. But if it drove Bruce Perrins to quit OSI, like that's not a minor thing, right? And I won't read Pam's quote to you because it's a lot of words, and you're not supposed to stand here and read words to your, to your audience. But Pam's a very smart person, and I think she's right here that the line between the software and the data is kind of blurry. And I'll come back to this here in a few minutes. But people are trying to write new licenses, and we're bringing back some of the old problems that we've had. 
So one of the great examples of this is the Hippocratic License, which is named after the Hippocratic Oath, which uh, many doctors take. And it says, first, do no harm. It's like, you can do whatever you want to your patient so long as you don't make it worse, is the, the idea here. And this came from um, primarily driven by some actions of the US government and some of, the, some of its use of uh, open source software that was used to do things that a lot of people found very morally repugnant. And so basically, the Hippocratic license said, you can't do really terrible things with the software under this license, which I completely understand the sentiment. You know, if I write something, I don't want it used to send like a busload of orphans off a cliff. Like that's not how I envision the software being used. But is it really open source? Because you can't, you can't restrict field of endeavor and have it meet the OSI's definition of open source. And so a lot of people are like, well, that's a fine license, I suppose, but it's not, you can't call it open source. Like, it's not an open source license, no matter what else you do with it. And you know, there's some debate about like, how do you draw the lines? Like, you know, OK, I think most people would agree busload of orphans over the cliff is bad. But like, if your software is used to you know, con people out of some money, that's bad, but is it bad enough? Like, where do you draw the line? Can, are you the only person who can use your software because you're the only person whose belief matches yours exactly? And again, if you're like me, you might not actually believe all the things you believe. The other thing that, that's come to light again is the, the whole concept of, oh no, this isn't a business model. Um, people like to think like, oh, I'm gonna open source it and it's cool, I'll get some people developing for it, we'll make some money, everyone will be great. And yeah, you can make money off open source. I know of a company that's done that fairly well. But it's a development model, right? It's not a, a business model. And so there have been a few companies that have kind of come to this conclusion that like, oh, hey, we put something out under a permissive license. And then Amazon used it under that license, following all the terms of it, and made a whole buttload of money. I want money, too. Well. I mean, you make choices when you pick a license for something, and there are trade-offs to any license you pick. You have to be aware of what the consequences are. Uh, this caused a lot of consternation when these companies changed their licensing. Uh, MongoDB had, was pulled from Fedora because the license is no longer um, meets Fedora's requirements. People will use other things instead, or they'll just get it from outside the Fedora repos. So th this is a real thing, and it's, you know, it was a huge blow up, right? Like people were like, oh my gosh. So, you know, winning isn't enough. And you can ask, well, have we really won? Because I spent this time saying, here's how the ways we've won. And then I point out the ways like, yeah, but like there's still a lot of work to be done. We're still kind of fighting each other again because now we're not focused on defeating the proprietary monster the monster, while not dead, is certainly um, weakened. So the current state of technology, <laughs> it's kind of bad. And we've done things, we like to believe that the work we're doing is great, it's gonna change the world. Most people that I've ever talked to maybe don't believe that the code they write is gonna change the entire world, but Maybe it'll make things a little bit better. Like, we're going to incrementally make the world a better place for us. That's not always true, and sometimes we can get a little myopic about it. The algorithm is not going to save us, because it turns out what you feed to an algorithm to, for like the machine learning parts is really important. Because, you know, it turns out there was an algorithm that said, yeah, let's just give black people in the US less health care. That doesn't seem right. And you know, maybe part of that was because for a few centuries in the United States, there were some structural issues that kept black people from gen accumulating generational wealth. And we still see the effects of that. And so maybe they can't afford to go to the doctor as much as the average white person or Asian person. Like, There's some bias that's sort of built into the way society has happened for the last thousands of years. And we need to make sure that we're not perpetuating it and reinforcing it with our algorithms. So then Amazon was like, hey, we're going to use AI to make smarter hiring decisions. And we're going to fix our diversity problems by, 
by using this algorithm, so we're all getting rid of our, our biases, except that it turns out when you tell the algorithm that all of our engineers look like this right now, it's gonna hire people that look like that. So you're just sort of perpetuating it. They gave up on using that, as far as they said. Um, there's entirely possible there's some e more evil going on under there. Face recognition software, um, turns out the data set matters, right? Um, you may have, if you, flown from the, if you flew here from the US, you may have had facial recognition as you went through on your, on your flight out of the US. Um, you may use your phone to unlock with your face or other things. You kind of want that to work, right? Like, okay, so there's considerations of, will it only match me? Will it not match my brother? Um, or in my case, like my son is a clone of me, just, you know, 30 years younger. Um, I, you don't want somebody else to do it. You don't want the data stored and used improperly. You can't just rely on some math to save us. So garbage in, garbage out became garbage in, garbage fire. And mostly not on purpose. Like there are some people out there who I won't name, but there's some people out there that I'm pretty sure just are in it to cause evil in the world. Most people aren't, but we're not necessarily aware of what we're doing. We're not thinking about the ramifications of what we do. And just because our software or our algorithms are open and available, that doesn't mean bad effects don't happen from them. All right, so now what? Well, what if there's just no such thing as winning? Like maybe winning is a thing we approach asymptotically, but we never actually quite get there. Like the frog that jumps halfway to the wall every time. Now in reality, the frog will eventually touch the wall because like physics. But you know, mathematically, no, it's not gonna happen. So what if we could just keep working on that incremental improvement that we were talking about? And this is the part where I actually do kind of stop asking questions and start giving some ideas. Um, they might be good ideas, they might be bad ideas, they're certainly incomplete ideas. But I would argue that while we were focused on software the last 10, 20, 30 years, it turns out the data is really what's important. Which isn't to say that the software isn't important, because it is, but Open source software without control and understanding of the data doesn't really help us. So I'm gonna give a hot take, and this is definitely among the things I'm not sure I believe, but I wanna be a little spicy here. So uh, you could argue, and I might, I'm still just thinking about this, but maybe free software is less important than protected and reliable data. If you have free software, and it's all out there and there's no such thing as proprietary software, that doesn't necessarily mean we're not, the data we provide to people won't be abused. How many of you have looked through every source, line of source code for all of the software you run? Good, nobody's hand went up, I would call you a liar to your face. <laughs> I, like, we rely on the fact that lots of people are looking at it, and they are, and people are, acting in good faith to try and fix bugs. No, no software is bug free unless it was never written. So just because software is open source, that doesn't mean there's not a line in there that says copy all this data up to my secret server. It might be found pretty quickly, but it could be there, it could be obfuscated. Um, so we, we can't just rely on free software, open source software to, to be the answer here. We have to think about the data because people will take the data and use it for bad purposes. Even, you know, I'm, I'm sure the, there's a lot of proprietary software involved in some of these um, technologies that law enforcement, especially in the US, are using to collect and analyze data. But I can guarantee there's a ton of free software, open source software in there as well. That didn't help. It's still being misused. Another thing we could do is we can fix our people problems. And what do I mean by fixing our people problems? Um, SourceForge recently had a blog post that said, open source is growing, but not how it should. It's basically, the, the premise is, people are contributing and the usage is going up, but we're not necessarily bringing in the contributors, the coders, the maintainers in a sustainable way. 
So we do have some people problems we can address. There's not enough contributors. I know of very few projects that are actually being used by people that would say, we have all the developers we need, we have all the documentation writers we need, we have all the designers we need. No, but please, nobody come help us. <laughs> you don't see that happen too often. Now, they might do it by their actions and you know, essentially say, please, we don't actually help us because we're jerks. But nobody explicitly says that. They always act like they want help. And our communities, by and large, are not representative enough. We have global communities, global users. Do our contributor communities look like our user communities? Do they work, look like the world population at large? Uh, you can look around this room and say it's probably not representative of the people who use computers or even the people who contribute to open source software. We can work on a variety of axes. We can talk about uh, gender representation, racial representation, socioeconomic representation, neurodiversity. Like, There's a lot of different ways that people are different. And we have to make sure that we're including them because we, otherwise we get things like face software works for white men and not for other people. Or uh, those automatic sensors in bathrooms work really well for light-skinned people but not dark-skinned people. That seems like a bad thing. We want our things to work for everyone. Um, there's not enough corporate support. Like We could fix that or at least try to. Um, you know, I'm very thankful that Red Hat provides the funding to the Fedora project that it does. I would love for Red Hat to provide more. I can find lots of ways to spend Shadow Man's money. Um, you know, companies like Amazon have just made a bajillion dollars off, largely off the backs of things like uh, Zen and Linux and all these other open source projects, and they do give back. Like, I don't, uh, don't get me wrong, they have a pretty large open source team. They contribute financially, they contribute code. Do they contribute in proportion to what they've, the value they've gotten from it? Probably not. And we're really bad about educating the users about why this stuff is important in the first place. We can't just go in and you know, scream at people and say, you're not using free software, it's terrible. Why don't you do that? Don't you like your freedoms? You have to meet people where they are. And I think a lot of times we focus very much on the philosophical aspects, and people don't care about other people's philosophy. Like They want to know what's practical. And you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can lead a user to free software, but you can't make them I don't know. I haven't really thought that analogy through all the way. <laughs> so there's lots of places we could go. We've come very far in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And so now it's time to think about, at the beginning of the decade, what's next? What's going to be what we, as a community, and I hate to say a community, as a large group of many different communities, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And I have about a minute and a half, um, so I'll just remind you of the places you can provide feedback. And if you have, so since I spent all the time asking questions, normally they say don't ask, you know, ask questions when you're in the audience, don't come up and give comments. We'll flip that around. I'll let you come up and give a comment. So we have like time for one, maybe two comments. Oh no, nobody was paying attention the whole time. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and I will see you at the pasta truck. <laughs>